Good morning, church. Welcome to all of you joining us here in Scotch Plains, and to those of you joining us online, a big welcome. I'm Roy McMillan, and I have the privilege of serving here as Community Life Pastor. And this morning, I'm honored to be able to bring the word to you this this morning. So we're in this series called Seven. And in this series, we've been looking at seven letters from Jesus to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And these letters are of great value to us as the church today. Because what they do is they reveal what Jesus loves and values in his church. But they also tell us what he hates and condemns. And in the first four letters, we've seen a few things. We've seen that the need to remain in Jesus and to remain in his love while also loving others. We've seen that the promise of eternal life far outweighs all of the problems and troubles that we face in life. We've seen the importance of eating at the table that Jesus sets before us and steering clear of the table of compromise. And we've seen how listening to Jesus' voice, the voice of the Good Shepherd, and not the voices of the world or those who deliver false teachings, it helps us to avoid being of the world and instead to be the light of Jesus to the world. We've also seen the consequences of disobedience and spiritual neglect. And we've seen the rewards of obedience and faithfulness to Jesus. The problems faced by the seven churches are not unlike the problems faced by the church today. And as we study these seven letters alongside the seven I am statements of Jesus in John's gospel, we see seven pictures of Jesus that help us to understand who he is and how he is the solution to our problems. Now, there are problems that require special attention. One such problem is something called drowsy driving. And Drowsy driving causes more than 6,400 U.S. deaths annually. And what happens in many of those cases is that people fall asleep at the wheel. It's enough of a concern that the week after daylight savings time ends, which happens to be next week, has been designated as Drowsy Driving Prevention Week. I bet you didn't know that. I didn't. I'm sure that we all have a story. It could be our own story. It could be a friend's story of a time that we got into a car and we started driving when we really shouldn't have. Maybe it was late. Or maybe we've been driving for too long. But we pushed ourselves when we shouldn't have done so, and we started nodding off. I can think of a time when I was with a group of friends, and we were driving somewhere, I think, in, I think it was in South Jersey or maybe in Pennsylvania, I don't remember exactly where, but we were on a dark road, it was late at night, I was driving, I'm in the car, and this is what's happening. And I'm starting to veer into another lane. Well, fortunately, one of my friends said, pull over, let me drive. I'm fine, I can drive. We avoided any problem. What happened to me is something called microsleep. And what microsleep is, is this. It's very short periods of sleep that last about 15 seconds or less. And during microsleep, a person may nod off, or they may keep their eyes open and continue to appear awake. But regardless of how someone appears, the brain 
is not processing external information as usual. And that's a concern. You think that you're on the right side of the road, but you've drifted and you're swerving into oncoming traffic in danger of a head-on collision with a tractor trailer or another car if you don't wake up. As we look at this next letter, we see that Jesus has a concern. There's a serious problem in one of his churches. They have fallen asleep. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. As we look at the church in Sardis, a church that had lost its way, a church that fell asleep at the wheel, and they desperately needed to get back on track. Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things you do, and that you have a reputation for being alive but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly, as unexpected as a thief. Yet there are some in the church, in Sardis, who have not soiled their clothes with evil. For they will walk walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my Father and His angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. Father God, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You that You have given us this Word, Lord, so that we can live in the way that You want us to live. And so, Lord, as we look at this church in Sardis, as we look at the problem that they were facing, I pray that you will help us to apply all that you have for us in our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So the city of Sardis had a very powerful history. But at the time that Jesus is writing to the church in that city, it's present didn't match its past. Now, historically, Sardis was quite spectacular. They had a reputation as a powerhouse in that region. But over the centuries, after experiencing an earthquake and suffering two significant sieges, Sardis lost its position of prominence. Now, one of those seizes seizes came at the hands of Cyrus the Great of Persia. And it happened because one of Cyrus' soldiers found the lone Sardian guard asleep at his post. That's an interesting fact, considering the warning given to the church to wake up. At the time that Revelation was written, Sardis was resting on the laurels of its 500-year-old reputation, but they had little more than their ancient name. And Jesus was telling the church in that city that it was just like the city itself. It once had a reputation for being alive, but it was now dead. And this letter was a warning to that church, but it's also a warning to the church today. 
Some of us are content with past encounters with Jesus. We're content to rest on the laurels of what God has done in the past, both in the church and in our own lives. But church, while it's okay to reflect, it's okay to reminisce, and it's okay to testify about about what God has done in the past, it's not okay to be content with that. Yes, we should look at what God has done in the past, and we should thank Him for it. But we need to look for more. We need to place more emphasis, more focus on what He's doing now and what He will do in the future. Like its city, the church in Sardis was a shadow of its former self. The flame of that church was nearly extinguished. What once burned brightly was now barely holding on to its embers. And Jesus was not pleased with what he saw. This church had a problem. It had fallen asleep. Now, the Sardian believers probably believed that they were alive. But Jesus tells them that they're dead. They thought that they were doing great things, but they were dreaming. They had become comfortable because unlike some of the other churches that we've heard about, they had no price to pay for their faith. And no doubt, even people outside of this church thought that this church was alive. But this was just a deception. They were looking at the church from the outside. But Jesus looked at it from within. And what he saw was entirely different. Church, Jesus sees past our deeds and he looks at the motivation of our hearts. He saw the deeds in Sardis, but he wasn't pleased. And last week we heard about the church in Thyatira and they were told that he saw their deeds and those deeds were growing. But the church in Sardis was not progressing in its faith. It was not growing. Its reputation did not match its reality. It was deceiving not only the world around it, but itself. And Jesus went so far as to say that this church's actions didn't meet the requirements of God. They were incomplete. The work that the Lord had given this church to do was left undone. Jesus had come back to see the work and found it unfinished. This church was found wanting. It looked good on the outside. It appeared to be doing all the right things. The worship may have been great. The preachers may have been eloquent and the ministry effective. But Jesus was telling this church, you are going down the wrong road. You've fallen asleep at the wheel. The Sardian believers thought that they knew the road. And that they could just go through the motions. But Jesus was alerting them that they were moments away from a head-on collision. On the outside, this church looked full of life. It looked good, it sounded good, and it appeared to be doing the right things. But God was not pleased with what he saw. Listen, church, God isn't looking for professional-sounding worship. He isn't looking for preachers who are more eloquent than Shakespeare. What he's looking for is this, a church that reflects his Son. Jesus looked at the life of this church and found it lacking. And so he began his letter by shouting a warning. Wake up! Jesus' warning is like the rumble strip in a road that causes vibration in your car to alert you that you've moved out of your lane and onto the shoulder. It's like the lane alert in your car that tells you 
that you're moving out of the lane you're in. And it's like the horn blast of a truck warning you that you've veered off the road and you're headed in the wrong direction. The church in Sardis had fallen asleep. They had gone off course. Jesus was now warning them to wake up. He was warning them that they were spiritually dying and they needed the life of the Spirit to come and give it new life. This church needed a fresh outpouring of God's presence. They needed to go back to seeking His face and to ask the Spirit to bring times of refreshing. Jesus' letter to this church was their wake-up call. It's also a wake-up call to us, church, because some of us have fallen asleep. Now, we may be doing all the right things. We may be reading the Word regularly, attending church on Sunday, volunteering our time and giving our tithes. But despite these things, we may be driving on an empty highway of faith asleep at the wheel. The right things have become nothing more than anything else we do on a regular basis. They become routine. And before we know it, we may find ourselves drifting onto the other side of the road, swerving into oncoming traffic, headed the wrong way. Now, the consequence of veering into oncoming traffic in a car is obvious. At any moment, it may result in a head-on collision. But what about allowing our faith to veer off path? Is there a consequence to that? The answer is yes. When we stray off the path, when we fall asleep at the wheel in our journey with Christ, we set ourselves up for a head-on collision, not with a vehicle, but with the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Church, we need to understand this. God's word is clear. Jesus will return. After his resurrection, Jesus ascended into heaven. And as his disciples stood there staring into the sky, two men in white stood among them and they said this. Men of Galilee... They said, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him go. Now, here's the thing. We know that Jesus will return. What we don't know is the day or the hour. In Matthew 24, 36, Jesus himself said, However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 tells us Jesus' return will come without any warning, like a thief in the night. And while we wait... It can be so easy for us to fall asleep and to be unprepared for his return. But here's what I need you to understand. His return is imminent. He can suddenly appear and we need to be ready. Matthew 24 verses 43 to 44 says this. And this is Jesus' words. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. We need to be ready all the time, not just some of the time, all the time. We need to be awake and not asleep at the wheel. And if we find ourselves falling asleep, then we need to wake up and get ourselves back on track. 
We need to find our way back to the Father. And there's only one way back to the Father, and that is through Jesus. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus told us this. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. There's a way that leads to life, and there's a way that leads to death. And the way to life is through Jesus alone. When we walk in the way of the world, when we look at success through the eyes of the world, we may think that we're living the dream. But what we're really doing is this. We're sleepwalking. We're walking in our sleep, unaware of the danger that's right in front of us. We need to walk with Jesus. He alone is the way and the truth and the life. We need to walk in the way, live by the truth, and receive the eternal life that only He can give by willingly yielding our lives to Him, turning from our sins and following Him. Now, like my friend who took the wheel from me when I began falling asleep and veering off the road, we need Jesus to take the wheel and get us back on the right track. We need to have him get us back in the right lane to move us back to where it's safe. After warning the church to wake up, Jesus provided the way to get back on track. So let's look again at Revelation 3, verses 2 to 3. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. So in these verses, Jesus outlines four things that the church must do to stay on track. That the church must do to stay in the way. First, we must strengthen what remains. Now, Many of you know that, that my wife, Linda, had cancer. What you may not have known is that she also has osteoporosis. And in the process of going through radiation treatments for her cancer, the osteoporosis got worse. And in fact, she started to develop fractures in her spine. And so, to strengthen the bones, and to strengthen her spine, she needed to go through physical therapy. She needs to continue to do exercises, and she needs to get regular injections to strengthen the spine, to strengthen what remains. Now, this church in Sardis had allowed things to fall over, and now it was called to shore up that which needed support. Cracks had been found in the foundation of its faith. And if these concerns were not addressed, then the church would topple. Earlier, I mentioned microsleep. And microsleep commonly occurs when people are performing monotonous tasks. Monotonous tasks like driving on an empty highway. Now, let's think about that in spiritual terms. When we allow our spiritual life to become a monotonous task, when we just go through the motions, we're in danger of falling asleep. Cracks will begin to form in the foundation of our faith. And unless we address them, unless we strengthen what remains, that foundation will crumble and our faith will be in danger of becoming a dead faith. So how do we address this? Well, I have a few suggestions. First, 
Find someone to share your struggle with. Someone who will push you to grow. Someone like a mentor or an accountability partner. That's one thing you can do. Do something different in your daily routine. Maybe do a Bible reading plan or a Bible study with your spouse or with a group of friends. Find friends who will pray for you as you work through your struggle. And then the last thing is join or start a life group. Because all of those things that I mentioned before can be found in a life group. Jesus called the church in Sardis a dead church. But he also pointed out that there was still some life left in that church. There was still hope of turning the steering wheel back toward the right way and getting back on the path that leads to life. So the next thing that he told them to do and the next thing he's telling us to do is to remember. What Jesus said is this, go back to what you heard and believed at first. So essentially what Jesus is saying here is remember my word, go back to the gospel. Now church, we can become so familiar that we forget. We can think that we know the fundamentals, but we really don't even know the basics. Several years ago, I worked as a personal trainer. And in order to become a personal trainer, I had to go through some training. But beyond that, I was required to go back and learn again. I had to take CEUs so that I could remember what it was that I learned at first. I needed to know how to do CPR. And I had to refresh that every two years so that I didn't forget what I had learned at first. That could have been the difference between life or death for a person that maybe had had a heart attack in front of me. Church, we can't press forward without having a solid foundation to build on. And when we get off track, we have to go back to the beginning. The gospel is our true north. And it's there that we've been given four witnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these four testify that God has come to rescue his people, that God has come to transform lives and to pour out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Following Jesus means becoming so acquainted with him, so connected to him, that we embody his story in how we live, move, and have our being. We need to remember this. If we lose our way and we veer off road, there is only one way to ride ourselves and get back on track, and that is to come back to Jesus. We need to come back. We need to sit at his feet and allow him to change us, to transform us, and to make us alive again through the power of his Holy Spirit. It's not enough to simply believe and confess the right things. Jesus said we need to go back to what we heard and believed at first and that we have to hold to it firmly. So what Jesus is saying here is that we need to return to the gospel, to his teachings, and then we have to hold on to them firmly. Church, when we find ourselves drifting, we need to return to Jesus' teachings, keep them in our hearts, and apply them in our lives. John 14, 15. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he tells them this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And here's what I want you to know. To love Jesus means living a life that demonstrates our relationship with him. A life that holds on to his words and turns them into actions. 
Because there's a problem when we know the word, but we don't do the word. There's a problem when we become complacent, when we just go through the motions and no longer live in a way that embodies the life-changing power of the gospel. James chapter 1, verses 22 to 24 says this, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and you forget what you look like. I mentioned that I had been a personal trainer. And when I got trained as a personal trainer, I had teaching on anatomy, exercise, physiology, nutrition, various other things. But if I didn't take that knowledge and put it into practice, if I didn't use that knowledge in working with clients, what use was it? It would be no use. It would have been meaningless. So reading the Bible and listening to good Bible teaching is not enough to keep us on the right path. If we believe that, we're deceiving ourselves. We should listen to good Bible teaching. We should do daily reading plans. But if we don't put into action or into practice what we hear and what we read, it's all meaningless. We need to do what the Word says. We need to live like Jesus, follow in His footsteps, and strive to be more like Him every day. As I get ready to close, I'd like to invite the worship team to come up. The last thing, the last of the four things that Jesus tells us we need to do to stay in the way is we need to repent. And this is the continuous call of these letters to the seven churches and to the church today. Repent. Return to God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Return to the way that leads to life. Because too many people veer off the path and they end up on a road that is leading them to death. Now, we may understand repentance as the realization that you've been on a road leading away from God and not towards Him. You're going in the opposite direction of your intended destination. But here, repentance is something far more fundamental to the Christian life. It's the realignment of our lives, our priorities, and our aspirations with God's. Here, it's turning back our hearts towards Christ when we've fallen asleep at the wheel and wandered off into the wrong lane. Like the sheep in Jeremiah 50 verse 6, some of us have lost our way and we can't remember how to get back to the sheepfold. But Jesus wants us to know that He is the way. When we've fallen asleep and we've drifted from the path that God has put before us, Jesus is giving us a way by which we can stay in the way. First, we need to wake up. And then we need to do four things. We need to strengthen up what remains. We need to look back. We need to remember what we heard and believed at first. We need to take hold of God's Word. We need to keep it in our hearts. And we need to apply it in our lives. And then we need to turn back to God. We need to repent and turn back. And if we don't do these things, if we don't wake up and get back on the right path, there is a consequence. Jesus will come like a thief. And He will erase our names from the book of life. He will not confess our names before the Father. Church, we can't allow ourselves to become apathetic or complacent. 
we must be ready. We need to heed the words of 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 6 to 8, which says this. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Church, we are called to live our lives in light of the great expectation of his return. Jesus promised those who remain faithful, those who don't soil their garments by, with evil by giving into the political, religious, and social systems of the world. He promised that they will be rewarded. They will wear the clothes of eternity for being faithful now. And Jesus also promised that all who overcome all who keep his commandments and repent will not have their names erased from the book of life. Now, the book of life resides in heaven, and in that book are recorded the names of the faithful, the names of those who have put their trust in Jesus and have rejected the powers of the world, despite the prosperity that those powers might have given them. But listen, the promise also contains a warning. Your name can be removed from the book. With Jesus, we have absolute assurance that those who follow the way, who align themselves with him, will have their names confessed before the Father and his angels. But those who choose the way of the world, those that slip and fall and drift away, will not receive the, ward, the rewards of the faithful. They will not receive life, but death. And my prayer today is that we will all find our names written in the book of life. I'd like to invite the prayer team to come forward at this time, and I'd like to invite all of you to stand. There may be some of you here today who know that you've fallen asleep at the wheel. You know that you've veered out of the right lane and you need to get back on track. You need to come back to what you first heard and believed. You need to let Jesus take the wheel. And if that's you, I invite you to come. Come to this altar and talk to Jesus. Tell him that you've gotten off track. Ask him to take the wheel. Ask him to help you to get back on the road that he has set for you. Ask him to put someone in your life who can help you to keep you moving in the right direction. Someone to come alongside you in prayer as you deal with your struggle to stay awake and on the right path. So if that's you, come. And if you'd like someone to pray with you, our prayer team is here to join with you in prayer. Now, there may be others here today who believe that God exists, but they're not quite sure what to make of Jesus. Now, believing God is real is not enough. Even Satan knows that God is real, and that won't save his soul. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Apart from Jesus, there is no salvation. Believing God exists will not lead you to him. Only Jesus can lead us to the gates of heaven. So if that's you, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, you need to let him take the wheel. You need to turn to Jesus, make him your Lord and Savior, and follow him. So if that's you, and you're ready to turn to Jesus, 
I want you to repeat this prayer from the bottom of your heart. Dear Jesus, I know that you have died, that you've given your life for my sins and the sins of the world. I know that you rose again and you conquered sin and the grave. I confess that I'm a sinner. But I repent and I turn from those sins and I turn toward you. I want to make you the Lord and Savior of my life. And so I turn to you, Lord, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. In your name, amen. If you've said that prayer for the first time, what I'd like you to do is this. Take out your phone and text the word CHANGED to 33777. And what that will allow us to do is to connect with you. We'll give you a book called Following Jesus that will show you the next steps. And we'll walk with you as you take those steps. So if that's you, text that word CHANGED to 3377. We're going to go into a time of worship, and then I'll come back and close us out in Jesus' name.